2003. Scores of American reporters have now joined U.S. military units in Kuwait as part of the Pentagon's effort to make any war with Iraq what the Pentagon calls a media-friendly campaign. Another part of that effort is on display at the U.S. Military Command Center in Qatar. A Hollywood set designer was brought in to create a $200,000 backdrop for official war briefings. And tied in with that is the worship of Pentagon technology. I, I, I've fallen almost in love with the F-18 Super Hornet because it's, it's quite a versatile plane. i got to tell you, my favorite aircraft, the A-10 Warthog. I love the Warthogs. <laughs> this morning around 4 a.m. local time, the first three took off. And when you're 300 feet away from them, when they do it, you hear it in your shoes and feel it in your gut. The Pentagon's influence on war coverage has also been evident in the news media's tendency to focus on the technical sophistication of the latest weaponry. Should they have used so. more? Should they, you know, use a Moab, the mother of all bombs, and well, a few <laughs> daisy cutters, and, right. you know, let's not just stop I, at a couple of cruise missiles. <laughs> yeah, only right. Newest, biggest, baddest U.S. bomb. We'll and pound them with 2,000-pound bombs and then go 2, in. 2,000-pound bombs in urban areas? Oh, sure. The plane I'm holding in my hand here, the F-117 stealth fighter, was used in these attacks significantly. How do you steer this thing? I mean, there's no, I mean, you have a stick, is that right? Sure. We have a... Uh, both of us have matching center stick with left throttles. Uh, you can do every... Every war, we have U.S. news media that have praised the latest in the state-of-the-art killing technology from the present moment to the war in Vietnam. B-57s, the British call them Canberra jets. We're using them very effectively here in this war in Vietnam to dive bomb uh, the Viet Cong in these jungles beyond Da Nang here. Colonel, what's our mission we're about to embark on? Well, our mission today, sir, is to report down to the site of the ambush 70 miles south of here and attempt to uh, kill the VC. The Colonel has just advised me that that is our target area right over there. One, two, three, four, we dumped our bombs and now it's a tremendous G-load as we pull out of that dive. Oh, I know something of what those astronauts must go through. Well, Colonel, <laughs> it's a great way to go to war. And there's a kind of idolatry there. Some might see it as worship of the gods of metal. That's the JDAM. Uh, it is a 2,000-pound bomb uh, that is deadly accurate, uh, and that is the thing that is allowing us, uh, allowed us in Afghanistan and will allow us in this next conflict to be terribly accurate, terribly precise, and terribly destructive. In fact, even as U.S. military technology has become increasingly sophisticated with the development of so-called smart bombs and other forms of precision-guided weaponry, civilian casualties now greatly outnumber military deaths a grim toll that has steadily increased since World War I. This is going to be the entire nine yards. It was a breathtaking display of firepower. There's kind of a, an acculturated callousness towards what happens at the other end of U.S. weapons. Behind the flight deck, the weapons officer who goes by the call sign Oasis will never see the ground or the target for that matter. The airfield is simply a fuzzy image on his radar. And this is another very insidious aspect of war propaganda. There's a bias involved where because the United States has access to high-tech military weaponry, that somehow to slaughter people from 30,000 feet in the air or 1,000 feet in the air from high-tech machinery is uh, somehow moral, whereas uh, strapping on a suicide belt and blowing people up is uh, seen as the exact opposite. The targeting capabilities and the care that goes into targeting to see that the precise targets are struck and that uh, other targets are not struck is as impressive as anything anyone could see. 
the care that goes into it, the humanity that goes into it, to see that uh, military targets are, are destroyed to be sure, uh, but that uh, it's done in a way and in a manner and in a, destruct in a direction and with a weapon that is appropriate to that very particularized target. The weapons that are being used today have a degree of precision that no one ever dreamt of. Within this war-friendly news frame, the Defense Department has also been successful in shaping actual war reporting. Its influence reached new levels with the embedding of journalists during the war in Iraq. The Pentagon tightly controlled the media during the 1991 Persian Gulf War, limiting where reporters could go and often restricting access to small groups of pool reporters. This time the Pentagon is doing an about-face. After running more than 230 journalists through media boot camps, the Pentagon is inviting more than 500 media representatives to accompany U.S. combat units to war. Despite being widely praised as a new form of realism in war coverage, the strategy of embedding reporters has raised new questions about the ability of war reporters to convey balanced information to the American people. U.S. Army 7th Cavalry. Rather than being kept far away, they were embraced and smothered and participated in the process of being smothered. They were brought along, hundreds and hundreds of them, with the Marines, with the Navy, with the Army. They became, in a sense, part of the invading apparatus. You didn't have embedded reporters with people who were being bombed. You only had embedded reporters with the bombers. Last night, a tremendous light show here, just a tremendous light show as we were watching. And it was through the eyes of the invaders that so much of the reporting was done. It was a gradual process of getting to know and trust each other, and for them, trusting me was knowing I would not blow their objective and get us all shelled with artillery. People who were correspondents for the major U.S. TV networks would express in no uncertain terms that they had been bonding very closely with the U.S. soldiers. We have a number of correspondents embed with our troops across the region. Some Very deeply embedded in a personal way with the Marine that he's traveling with. But he does remind... And you had correspondents saying that, you know, I would do virtually anything for them, they would do anything for me. There's all this camaraderie. We had guys around us with guns. And they were, they were intent on keeping us alive because they said, you guys are making us stars back home, <laughs> so we need to protect you. We need to, you know. That's very nice, except it has nothing to do with independent journalism, which we never need more than in times of war. It was a very shrewd effort by the Pentagon to say, you want access? Here's plenty of access. I doubt that, that in a conflict of this type there's ever been the degree of free press coverage uh, as you are witnessing in this instance. And the embedding process was actually a new wrinkle in an old game, which was and is propaganda for war. Praise for the embedding process as a step forward in balanced war reporting has often invoked comparisons to media coverage of the Vietnam War. A myth has kind of grown up case, after the Vietnam, Vietnam War that the reporting was very tough that Americans saw on their television sets the brutality of the war as it unfolded. And people often hark back to that as a standard that should now be rediscovered or emulated. This is what the war in Vietnam is all about. Yes, there was exceptional reporting, but it was the exception. And so you had the Zippo lighters being used by the GIs burning down the huts of a village that Morley Safer on CBS reported. Well, people mentioned that actually because it was unusual. And in point of fact, very little about the tremendous violence in that war was conveyed through the television set, especially when the U.S. government is responsible for the human suffering. That is, in a way, the most taboo, to show in detail, in graphic human detail, what's involved when bombs, missiles, mortars, paid for by U.S. taxpayers, do what they're designed to do, which is to kill and to maim. I know that this is a great concern. Uh, I think it's part of the Vietnam Syndrome. The Vietnam Syndrome that President Reagan mentioned was a reference to America's attempt to forget its most unpopular war. 